we cover three important tools of communication to connect. And I think coaches need that, podium speakers need that, uh, CEOs and leaders of nonprofit organizations need these three, and then that is what Aristotle defined as uh, logos, ethos, and pathos. Mm -hmm. So fancy words for content, credibility, and connect. Uh, hello everyone, welcome to the Anatomy of Ed, the official Masters Union podcast. We have with us today Professor Mihir Mankar, who is a professor of the Arts of Communication course at Masters Union and other business schools worldwide. Professor Mihir is, he describes himself at least as an accidental academic who fell into the world of academia by accident. Uh, his illustrious career spans management consulting, being a live reporter for many emerging in big sports events such as the Tokyo Olympics that was held a few years ago. And in our conversation today, we'll talk about communication, about how we can delve into different modes of communication, what he does in his classroom today, and how perhaps different communication styles are outputted or exercised in different use cases, including football. All right. Uh, thank you, Professor, for joining us today. Uh, we have a great half an hour ahead of us of great conversation. Um, one thing I'm curious to ask you about is that you've just come in after your conversation and your teaching experience with our first cohort, uh, sorry, first, uh, let's say, week, first couple of weeks of students that are coming in for our third cohort. So how was your experience like with these students? Yeah, no, you know, one of the reasons I've been into teaching is the stimulation that I get back from the students, hmm. as you know, I teach a public speaking hmm. course, but I think it transcends public speaking. It's about communication to connect, hmm. one to few, one to one, one to many. And there's also a forum for the students to share their stories. Right. And what I really enjoy is the diversity and the passion that students bring in their stories. Right. Uh, I think I have, uh, I've been a little lucky to have a course like this hmm. where it's not just a one-way street, hmm. that it, it's also about giving students a voice. And sometimes they get a voice that gives them a new lease on life. Right. So at the end, it's, it's always busy because a lot of speech recitations right. come at the end. Uh, but it's also exhilarating because uh, the community has come together right. through communication. And I think it's a great uh, course to have right at the starting. Yeah. You know, get the cohort bonding is something that uh, really takes shape post this course. I'm curious, uh, you mentioned one-to-one, -one, one to many. So it seems that communication needs to be adapted to different styles. And I think that's one of the elements that you speak about in your classroom as well, about adaptive communication. So perhaps if you could just break that down, what would you mean by that? And how would, say, one go for a one-to-one -one or one-to-many, what, what would be the salient point one keeps in mind? Yeah, so at the heart of my course is the ability to connect to different audiences and to different situations. So at the core, we say we want to sharpen the what to say, hmm. uh, the how much to say, and hmm. then the how to say it. Hmm. And sometimes the when to say it too. Right. And I think those, uh, those decisions are quite different depending on the sensibility and the scenario. What you talked about was adaptive leadership, which is something that I cover in a module. And adaptive leadership is a kind of leadership required when, uh, you know, you have to react to a new technology or to a, to a new threat in the workplace that involves changing the cultures, ideas and values of an organization. Mm. So you need to completely rethink the way you operate. And at that time, leaders need to find a blend of building trust, but also regulating distress. And so there are some case studies that I've written in which students become protagonists in these adaptive situations. And it's not just public speaking, but it's also thinking about ways to, to do both, build trust and regulate distress and also give the work back to the people. So it, it really pushes them on the content as well as the delivery. Uh, but, you know, my, my longer 13 week course developed in the U.S., has uh, 13 weeks for 13 different styles of verbal communication. So, you know, you have elevator pitching mm -hmm. and interviewing on the one hand, then you have larger core value speeches that you can deliver on a podium, all the way to press conferences and media interviews. Mm -hmm. And each of these speaking scenarios requires different sensibilities mm -hmm. and really living through that experience. Mm -hmm. So in the, in the short, in the three to four week courses that I teach here of 20 hours, I try and bring the best of those scenarios. Those elements. Yeah. And by definition, some of them apply 
to one to few and some one to many. Got it. But I think some of these sensibilities you can also take for critical one to one conversations. Hmm. I, I would assume there's a lot of transferability of skills once you get good at a certain style. You could apply it to other domains. I'm actually curious to bring in a few real life examples to you and maybe ask you uh, how that room would look or the style of communication would be in that particular space. Uh, one thing I'm curious to know about is these days uh, there's a big legal feud between Elon Musk and Twitter. Mm -hmm. So imagine if there's a deposition, what would you say the style of communication is there between, uh, let's say, the teams representing both of these parties? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a this is a holistic matter. Hmm. And so on the one hand, you have Elon Musk, and hmm. on the other hand, you have Parag Agarwal. Hmm. But hmm. Parag Agarwal is perhaps not as much of a one-person communication army representing his organization. Yeah. There'll be a number of constituents. Uh, so as far as Elon Musk, you know, I think uh, his speaking is certainly magnified given his status as one of the, the richest people in the world. Uh, and it's also a bit polarizing. Uh, at the heart of our class is this ability to have impact, but also be likable. Hmm. And uh, there are, at a certain level, certain sensibilities when you're speaking to larger groups to be able to cater your communication to a lower common denominator. Right. And often the best orators are not the most effective communicators because there is a need to adapt to your audience. Got it. Now, Elon Musk has had a lot of experience facing the media, facing difficult situations when people put him on the spot. So I think he has sharpened what I define as his communication presence, which I define as that ability to draw on your most relaxed and authentic self in the most challenging situations. But I will also say that part of his his bravado, his, his, uh, the same spirit that allowed him to create one of the world's most valuable companies, hmm. sometimes puts him in a situation where it can draw some peril or that he can be a little clumsy hmm. at times. And uh, that's always uh, the disadvantage of being so rich and so powerful hmm. that you almost feel like you don't need to consider uh, trying to appeal to everyone at the same level where someone's hungry to, to get to the top does. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, on Twitter's side, this has been a company that has uh, seen its zenith uh, in, in prior years, but it's it's kind of come down a little bit uh, from some competition from the different platforms. You have a newish uh, CEO who's, who is not necessarily the, the loudest person in the room, hmm. though can, can lead from the front and from the back. Uh, when it needs to. And I think they, they have a point in saying, you know, we prepared ourselves yeah, yeah. uh, to for this deal. You put your, you put your communication in public hmm. and you put it down. And now, you know, at this stage, you can't just back out without either very good explanation or very good compensation. Right. So I think this is going to be an interesting uh, feud to, to watch through. And I think communication can, will surely play an impact on which side comes across stronger to yeah. the public and then to the decision makers on the jury. Yeah, and uh, one more maybe instance I'd like to hearken you to is in the world of sports. And I'm one thing I'm very passionate about is football and, and you know, looking at other sports as well. When it's a final or a semi-final, you look at these half-time talks, especially for teams who are maybe losing, uh, teams who are uh, winning or maybe teams who need that final comeback. So, uh, an example I can give is of the Champions League final that happened between Real Madrid and Liverpool. So, you know, Real Madrid were coming from a context of really having struggled over the last three, four games and have pull in, you know, pulled narrow victories. So, what would you say communication style would be in that half-time dressing room with the coach really trying to motivate his players to win for the second 45 minutes? Yeah, you know, so I enjoy watching some of these half-time shows and mm. in the NBA, the National yeah. Basketball Association, they actually have some of the coaches mic'd up yeah. and uh, they deliver these, these talks and it's quite interesting because uh, here it's also a function of an individual style versus best practice. And I think that's something I see in the classes too. I don't ask people to converge to a certain style or to a certain structure even. What I try to do is give them a lot of case studies and then they develop their own style. And style, structure and storytelling go together. Uh, so I think in the match that you're talking about, it was a narrow 1-0 victory yeah. for uh, Real Madrid. And if I remember, Real Madrid did shoot that goal in the first half. Yeah. And so for them, it was about keeping the lead, while for Liverpool, uh, a lot of their stars uh, were under pressure in that half and they had a lot more shots on goal. Hmm. And it was frustrating to, to not convert that to a victory. So personally, I think the halftime talk would have been standard, whether you are up, up or, uh, or 
lower given the styles of the individual coaches. But I think equally or even more important would be what the coach would say of Liverpool hmm. after so many more shots on goal and then missing out coming right. so close. And that communication that the coach provides is not just for the press, but also towards the players, towards the management for upcoming years. Hmm. I think it's, uh, I mean, post a defeat like that for Liverpool, it almost becomes more like extremely important at what that point of time, what the coach says. Yeah. I think that could really critically shape the mood and the, the how they decide to pick themselves up, for example, for next year. Yeah, and so let me get back to it at a more general and a basic level and in theory. Uh, we cover three important tools of communication to connect. And I think coaches need that, podium speakers need that. Uh, CEOs and leaders of non-profit organizations need these three and then that is what Aristotle defined as uh, logos, ethos and pathos. Mm -hmm. So fancy words for content, credibility and connect. And I think you need all three of these to really resonate. Uh, logos has to do with the logical appeal of your talk, your speech, your presentation. If the logic is not sound, most of the times it won't connect. However, sometimes the logic can be very sound, but you don't have the right pathos. Hmm. And pathos is defined as the emotional appeal. Hmm. So in, in the dressing room at halftime, after the game, whether you won or lost, that there has to be the right emotional appeal through your words. Hmm. And emotional appeal is not being emotional. Sometimes it is being stoic as it's required, right. but that's needed. And then the third one is ethos, which is often underestimated. And that is the credibility that you bring as a speaker. So you draw on... Having seen this in the past several times and the resiliency and how it brought teams back is what perhaps the losing coach can draw on to provide a little more credibility to his points. Got it. And when you get all three, uh, then it's rare that you don't connect with the audience. Yeah, yeah. Um, so kind of taking the theme of adaptability, one thing I was curious to ask you about was the effect of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, one thing, I, a use case I'd like to present to you is the interview for MBA schools. Mm -hmm. uh, earlier, we used to conduct physical in-person interviews, but then like the rest of the world, we switched to Google Meet and to Zoom. So what do you feel about the loss of, say, having body language? Or is it something that, you know, we have to now learn to adapt towards of becoming better interviewers and interviewees in this online medium? Yeah, I think that's a very relevant and important question. Mm. And uh, it's, I'm glad you asked it because this is the subject of my second book. Uh, that book uh, was entitled Shine on Zoom. I'm working on it. I might change it to Shine Online mm. because people are using WebEx mm. as well as Microsoft Teams and other platforms. But it's becoming increasingly important mm. for leaders to be able to have communication impact, to humanize that piece of computer equipment, which is the camera. Mm. And, you know, so psychologically, when you're used to facing people, realize it's very difficult for people to stare into a machine and imagine it being a person. And on top of that, when you don't see people on the other side, when routine check-in is taken away, there tends to be a little more of, a, of an inversion and a feeling amongst many managers who were, uh, who were leading teams very effectively in person to feel disconnected. There is also a generation gap right now where people who are in their 40s and 50s didn't really grow up with the technology that much younger, uh, younger groups are. And I think that creates an unfair disadvantage for them. So I think it's very important to really take stock and think about how you interact with the camera whether you can use certain tools such as teleprompters. You know, you don't have to read your document, but teleprompters can create uh, some impact and also take away some of the pressure of keeping precise script. Additionally, you can use things like annotations. You can think about lighting to make sure that your face is really seen. Hmm. A lot of people don't recognize right. that the lights should be in front of you. Hmm. They have a tube light at the back. Hmm. And so if you can't see your expression, how are you going to have impact? Hmm. You know, how you're able to draw people to share your videos so that you can see them a lot more and feel that there's someone in front of you. And then there's several other tools like having the green screen behind you and having a software that I use called eyeglasses that allow you to even change the zoom on your computer mm. so you can decide how much of your body you want to have seen Got it. for the right meeting. Got but it. it is certainly something that needs deliberate thought and I'm hoping right. that some of my, my work helps people to uh, to humanize that camera and ease online communication. No, for sure. I think this is a message that definitely needs to be pushed out in terms of the hygiene checks that people need to keep because it's online it's a visual medium at the end of the day and there's a certain aesthetic component to people being say either politely happy or politely surprised or politely disappointed but, yeah, but on, on that note i will say uh, uh, Karan, that uh, 
people sense that, well, I can't really see the expression, mm. but as a teacher, I can more clearly see on my 27 inch screen mm. on gallery view, the expression of students and participants, then perhaps I can see 50 feet away. And I think that mindset needs to change. And I think you need to draw that out that you can tell people when you see the expression that, you know, I'm not sure you're really getting this point or you look particularly excited about this. When you when you say that in the middle of, say, a webinar mm. or uh, an interactive class, it wakes people up on the other side that you are really seeing and sensing them. Got it. <clears throat> but uh, just to kind of stick to the use case of the interview, I'm, I'm curious to know your perspective on the power dynamic of it all. Um, let's take a typical use case for a, let's say, traditional B school. You walk in, there's one lone chair that's kept in the middle. On the other side, there's perhaps a round table with three or four people sitting there. And now you look at Zoom interviews where there's just one person. The, I feel there's a sense of uh, loss of that power dynamic of being exposed, of having these four people peering at you. Now you have your ownership of your own screen. So would you say that uh, students should become more cognizant and perhaps take advantages of the hygiene things that you mentioned to perhaps amplify that interview opportunities or interview chances? Yeah, so I think, uh, well, interviews, first of all, are about content and delivery. Mm -hmm. And on the delivery part, I feel that some of these shines that I talk about for online impact provide, uh, you know, the last 20 percent to make sure that you come across as your best. But for me, I, I always find confidence in the fact that communication based on substance, hmm. uh, the logic is, is still king. Hmm. And and that the, the good candidates will be heard and seen as long as they can demystify some of their nervousness on camera and evaluate it in the same way, whether it's online or offline. Got it. In terms of, uh, I guess, the grandness of the situation, I mean, sometimes you can have four on one or four on four interviews too. And you do see all the panelists, you know, in boxes in front of you, their faces are magnified mm. on a you know reasonably large screen. Mm. Uh, you can see that expression even closer mm. than I feel you would in a room. Of course, it's different, you know, as you said, walking into a real life space and meeting and shaking hands and, and seeing them, it's different. But, uh, you know, first of all, I'm so happy that during this time that uh, such a calamity had to happen to the world, the right. pandemic, that technology had advanced that, you know, work didn't stop, that interviews didn't stop. Right. And uh, largely, I feel that good people have been getting into schools, you know, before and after the pandemic. So I think it's up to the, uh, the interviewee to demystify some of this and, and really believe that uh, there isn't a real disadvantage, hmm. that, that there are benefits of online communication. You can do things like, hmm. you know, you can have chats. If you're teaching, you can have polls, you can do uh, better uh, breakout rooms too. And once you start to embrace it, uh, the interviewer will see it. Okay. And I think at a, at a higher level, I what I tell students is really prepare, the, for example, for the fit interview, I say five most commonly asked interview questions. Hmm. And if you go in prepared, there is a sense of confidence and, and sort of authenticity and then joy that's seen on your face. Hmm. And I think that also applies to an online interview. If you own your content, you can start to own the room hmm. and uh, that will come across online or offline. Awesome. But given with the online medium, let's just stick to it for, for a moment. Do you feel um, in your own experience over the years, there's always this question of the death of the attention span of us moving from, say, written articles that people consume towards more uh, shorter and shorter, shorter videos. So aren't you competing as someone who's delivering a communications course with someone with say most snackable content that's readily available. Absolutely. In fact, that's uh, the, the introduction and the first the premise of the book that I put together, Minutes of Magic. That attention spans have become shorter. Mm. And while TED Talks used to typically allow 18 minutes for a speech, mm. these days, if you have 18 minutes in a TED event, uh, the auditorium starts to empty mm. at the halfway point. Mm. And uh, in my classes, students deliver four minute speeches. Mm. And I think you're right. It's even mag more magnified when you have uh, online impact. And that's one of the lessons uh, in our shines in class that I have is on concise and precise. Mm. That, that there's a greater need to be even more concise and precise online because there's so many distractions. People could all tab, go to another application right, when right. they're listening to you. They could shut off their, their camera and be trying to you know multitask. And so, for example, we have a, 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 sh a slide that would typically take uh, two to three minutes to go through. It has about 40 pieces of information that hmm. I show in class, hmm. uh, an estimation of the number of car tires in the U.S. all yeah. on one slide. But I tell class members that if you're going to be doing this, 
online, it's similar to if a CEO walks in and has very little time, hmm. you need to give the 45 second version and hmm. not the three minute version. Right. So I think that should be there in your pocket, the ability to give a, a short response or a longer one and online you want to cater it to even shorter and shorter. So I think that ability of being concise and precise has become even more important over the last... Uh, oh, absolutely. Process. Concise, precise and compelling. Yeah. But let me uh, clarify that concise and precise doesn't mean short. Right. I think you can be concise and precise in a 45-minute address. Right. As long as there is not that much repetition. People tend to repeat a lot when, when they're trying to fill time. Hmm. That there is purpose to every sentence. And that there is, uh, you know, both logos, pathos and, and, and ethos when it's needed hmm. in your communication. Understood. And maybe now kind of to move uh, tracks, I'm, I'm curious to ask you, uh, when it comes to communication, uh, I, I think of obviously there's verbal communication that we have when delivering speeches, as you said, one to one, one to many. But uh, personally, for me, I studied a lot of music, specifically jazz music. I know there's a big culture of communication within that sphere as, as well, in terms of communicating with the audience, communicating with the bandmates as well. So, is do you think you know there's other avenues or other worlds that uh, where we can draw inspiration for 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 linguistic or for speech purposes? Yeah, absolutely. Now, in the scope of my class and the hours that I have and the, the methodology or the pedagogy that will keep students engaged, I focus on verbal communication. Hmm. And so it comes down to speeches, but also simulated town hall meetings, elevator pitches, right. introductions, personal professional introductions, uh, core value speeches. Uh, however, there is certainly an entire world of uh, written communication, which I tend to think is the purview more of college. So I teach in grad schools and executives. And, and at that time, as I was having a discussion with the dean of a major business school, hmm. I don't think the graduate students really need to be taught how to write a, hmm. an email or to, to edit or format slides. I think you can find that more easily. So uh, the purview of my class has been more on verbal communication and in, you know, intense pressure, high stakes environments. But I think uh, towards the end, we have an exercise where students can pick a, uh, a video of a communication piece and hmm. write uh, analysis right, so. on it. And for that, lately, I've allowed things like songs, poems, and even podcasts. Right. Uh, so certainly, uh, the mode of communication is changing towards social media. Uh, Given that time has always been a constraint, I've focused on certain parts, but it, it is time to start thinking about uh, more forms of communication right. I mean, towards impact. So I'm, I'm coming from a place where you look at, say, the concept of prosody in poetry or stress and intonation or, let's say, motivic development, if you want to, uh, like, you know, as transferable skills that you could use when you're delivering a speech. I mean, as you said, you could be compelling within 45 minutes. And how would you do that? And to someone as a layman, it might sound like a extreme exercise on how they'd be engaging for 45 minutes. Yeah. But to kind of have that uh, narrative in your head of those motifs that you want to keep dropping in here or there or knowing when to stress certain points or knowing when to leave space, knowing how to do, say, data with storytelling. If I, I mean, I can drop a number of 25 million over here, for example. Or I can say that's the, you know population of Australia and that's the amount of women for example that have dropped out of the workforce in the last 15-20 years. So I think do these elements then make an impact when you're delivering uh, verbal communication or speeches or something? Absolutely and uh, the art of storytelling is that again the center of uh, most of the speeches hmm. that uh, for core value speeches that every student has to do. Uh, the thought is uh, show versus tell. Hmm. You know, create imagery and right. share personal anecdotes to connect. Otherwise, it'll sound preachy. And that is something that people get. Uh, what this book is, is a collection of 80 of the best speeches out of 4,000 that I've heard around the world. And all of them have used storytelling in their four minutes or 240 seconds uh, to, to really connect. 240 seconds is about 600 words. Hmm. And in 600 words, there are amazing stories that are painted. The only thing is, uh, you know, what people don't sometimes may not recognize is that they feel they come to a class on communication to be told a formula, hmm. to be given a prescription of how to do this. And there are so many different ways to storytell. Once you understand that you want to show versus tell and be personal without being private necessarily, then it is your own canvas to paint. Hmm. And I think a great way of learning this is diving into the formulas of, of hundreds and thousands of others hmm. to see how they resonated. And there, there's scope for all the creativity that you were talking right. about too, right? Some right. people weave in some some poetry, some people take you on a, a journey of grief, some people are able to not share anything 
that deeply personal but still create powerful storytelling. But storytelling is at the heart of communication. And I think it's at the heart of professional communication too. The way to learn it is through osmosis. Hmm. And I think you're completely right there in terms of looking at, uh, you know, the formulas, principles of others. I always think of it, if you steal it from one person, it's plagiarism. But if you steal from a lot of people, it's research. So it's um, something that I feel that, as you correctly pointed out, it's through a practical lived experience of doing it again and again and again and again through yeah. which you'll get better rather than learning a, a you know going through a formula or a certain set of this is the way I do it yeah and so would you say for yourself personally having put yourself in so many different situations from hosting giant events to being in the national media do you think there's a situation that phases you now when you have to go and uh, speak somewhere do nerves come to you anymore yeah I mean I, you know I've been asked that question and it's a little you know, it's certainly not modest to say no, but mm. I, I did feel, I was asked that question at one point, I did say that largely I, I don't. I mean, of course, I feel a little bit of nervousness in new scenarios, but I'm able to get through it. But uh, then, you know, there's always a situation that, that challenges you mm. even further. And I think there'll always be these situations. Uh, for example, a couple of months ago, I was at, a, at another business school and I had trained a group of executives and they'd asked me to just come into their graduation ceremony. It was a three-month program. And they were mid-careers, so I said I would, you know, come in and I was sitting somewhere in the middle and then just uh, without any warning, they said, uh, you know, would you come down, professor, and give the, the address to the wow. group. Uh, so, I mean, this, you know, I was in the middle of a class, I was going to stop in for 15 minutes. And I mean, I couldn't say no, you know, as a communication professor, but I was also felt that there was pressure on me. So this happened and, you know, I said something. Which, which was okay. I mean, it, I mean, I was a little nervous thinking that I have absolutely no time to even research again the, the other subjects they've taken, what this group would go and do. I just taught them an online class. Uh, but the next time it happened, it happened again and I was expecting it and it was a little better. So I think with iteration, it keeps getting better. Got it. Uh, also, I was called in to host last year the Olympics on yeah. fairly short notice uh, with by Doordarshan, who, uh, for whom I'd hosted many of the other multi-sport mm. events, Commonwealth Games, Asian Games, mm. Olympics. Uh, and it was on short notice and they created a program that, that I felt was 10 on degree of difficulty because mm. after sitting on the anchor chair, uh, with 10 minutes break, they ask you to stand and they start displaying all the highlights across every major sport in visual form. And it's a it's a 20 minute monologue with, uh, with things populating behind wow. you. So sometimes you may not even have had enough time to fully read the, the article on weightlifting. And mm. then there's archery and then there's, there's, you know, lawn balls one after the other and you're supposed to say something. Mm. So again, when 30 million people are watching, it's right. live. Uh, and without direction, it, it, it certainly gets you flustered a little bit. So there are certain times where you feel you feel that pressure. But what's helped me is slowing time down. Right. And I think this is something I do want to explain that when what anchors get by facing the camera 600 times versus their first uh, 10th or 20th time is that everything slows down. I can hear your question better. I can process it better even when I'm uh, when I'm tired or coming in from something else. And that gives you a little more confidence that even if you're not perfect, it's okay. Hmm. And I think to go for excellence rather than perfection. Got it. Uh, so I think it's like Keanu Reeves uh, hmm. in The Matrix, you know, when the bullets initially, yeah. they can come fast, but when he, he ad achieves that Matrix Nirvana, he can s slow down those bullets. Right. And I think that is something that happens through practice, not uh, God-given talent. Yeah, I would 100% you know, concur with that statement. I'm curious to know, having gone through such intense experiences, at least that would be my description of it, uh, that would be practice through action. Uh, is it uh, improvisational in nature when you come and speak or is it something that you still work on composing and formulating or because you've done this so many times it, you just come and it's you know you're not really thinking about the subject matter anymore you're looking at the energy of the classroom and uh, the vibe so as to say I mean what I'm doing now in the classroom is not representative of what most people will do mm. in, in business and uh, even personal communication because mm. now I've taught this class 65 times I've taught 120 executive sessions and I know by my speech is by heart. Hmm. Uh, rarely will you get so many iterations to, to do the same thing, though you might, some salespeople might, uh, some other teachers, of course, do. Uh, however, when, uh, when you are coming in for something that has a realistic amount of time, so in pretty intense uh, MBA, post-MBA environments like management, consulting, private equity, banking, you are on an intense project and you don't have the luxury of, of too much time, I still feel people don't spend enough time towards the 
the delivery and the thinking about the presentation and are constantly just working on their computer to the last minute and they feel they can just go up and, and create a good presentation or mm. story. In the class, uh, the simulation is for a life-changing speech. And, and what I tell them is to create a, a powerful four-minute speech. The, it takes 10 hours. It took about 10 hours or more for uh, the speakers in Minutes of Magic to create just four minutes. Mm. And so that that is a kind of effort that would be ideally required, but mm. if not 10 hours on an everyday basis, I, I do feel an important presentation needs a couple of hours at least to think about how are you going to bring this deck together? What do you want to say in the opening and the closing? What is your executive summary? What's your one sentence summary? What's your one paragraph summary? Mm. And I think you should know this uh, well in, in any important stake. And there's a famous saying, right, that if you want me to speak for five minutes, give me a week to prepare. Mm. If you want me to speak 15 minutes, give me a day. Yeah. If you want me to speak for a half hour, I can start now. Yeah. Uh, so sometimes less uh, might be more in mm. terms of preparation. Awesome. Um, so then just to wrap up, I have a, a, a question. Might not be directly related to communication more. One piece of advice you'd give for, say, their education, maybe what they'd look for the future. One thing for their career and maybe one thing in their personal lives. Uh, an average 25, 26-year-old a uh, person living in India, what, 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 should it, what should they be thinking about? Yeah, okay. So I, I don't know if there'll be a dichotomy between personal and, pro and professional, but I will give perhaps three or four messages that I think are, are relevant. Uh, one is that the world is quite forgiving. You know, I'm a case in point. Uh, there is a, a sense that, you know, if we don't make the right decision now, you know, things will be a disaster. And life is long, your career is long. Typically, even for a 25-year-old, a career is going to be about 50 years. Yeah. And uh, what you do right now, to some extent, can pave a path, but it is certainly not indelible. And that's important to realize so that you don't put pressure on yourself. All right. Uh, the second thing is, I do believe that, uh, you know, people have a certain inclination. They have specific and individual interests and passions and that you should seek them and your heart and head will know when it feels right. Uh, this is what Steve Jobs has said. Mm -hmm. But I think you need to have patience in the early part of your career, but still keep looking. So I don't want you, you know, I feel you shouldn't go into your first job saying, no, this is not stimulating me like I was in college. Mm -hmm. Well, jobs aren't catered to you while college and grad school, you pick right, your yeah. subjects. Yeah. So have that patience. But after a while, after you've given your best, uh, you know, then don't be scared to walk away. But while you are in that job, give you 100 percent because that reference, that that goodwill, you know, will follow you. And, and then I feel that uh, largely, uh, you know, in the long run, if you're not having fun, you're probably still not doing it right. Mm. And uh, what that means is that uh, you, you need to, to get on a path where you really need to feel that this is seamless. You shouldn't be compromising with your work uh, and saying, well, I'll just enjoy my leisure time because your work will occupy a lot of your life. And sometimes that pleasure, that joy can also come through rigor and repetition. I think uh, uh, Chick Selmihai talks about the yeah. flow state. Yes. specifically with work. So I think that's what you're kind of referring yeah, to. Yeah, so in, in my job, maybe I'm repeating the same things mm. for case studies, but there is joy in feeling that what I'm you know, imparting to the students, the uh, community is, is impactful, it is stimulating. And uh, so, you know, joy doesn't mean that the, the content always has to be super fun. Uh, but, you know, the world is not going to give you things on a platter as you may have expected in the structure of school college and grad school mm. so having patience but following your heart is important all right okay awesome that's a wrap thank you so much for joining us today it was a pleasure uh, talking to you and i got to learn a lot yeah and i'm sure everyone watching this would be equally as delighted no so it's a pleasure you. and thank you for inviting me here i will say that uh, one thing about coming to a master's union is I feel that the students are very well bonded. I, I worked with the first group and it was 65. And the benefits of a small class is that you really get to know each other and that you really look out for each other. So they were feeling each other's speeches when it went well, they had joy. When it uh, didn't go well, they felt a little more displeasure than I would feel that you would, you know, you would experience in larger classes. And that uh, your community has provided me a lot of love, respect. And my own mother was here for a bit and she felt that too. So thank you. No, long may that continue. Thank you, sir. Great. Awesome.